welcome to this um, creating a global knowledge commons for mission 4.7. So this side event session is going to formally launch a position paper by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, UNESCO and the SDSN, and it's about the importance of partnerships with libraries to create open science data, educational resources for use in education, training and sustainable development. And the premise is that libraries can be key partners in underwriting a global knowledge commons for the SDGs on ethics, standards, systems, processes and practices, including quality assurance processes, discoverability, interoperability, archiving, preservation, copyright and so on. Specific applications of the building blocks would include libraries contribution, both in creation and publishing and making openly accessible content to the global public um, in order to uh, engage STG 17 partnerships for distance and open learning and teaching capacities across nations, parliaments, governments and in low resource communities and citizen science. So we've got a wonderful lineup today of people and we're going to have some a number of very short presentations from each one of them. I'm Neve Brennan, I'm Program Manager for Research Informatics in Trinity Innovation and Enterprise, Trinity College Dublin, where I moved recently from TCD Library. And um, I was lead researcher on the position paper on the cont contribution of libraries to education for sustainable development. I'd just like to take the opportunity before we begin to thank 16 IFLA Global Libraries for funding the position paper, to the SDSN for coordinating it, to UNESCO for its support and engagement, and thanks to the many expert interviewees who contributed, and above all to the team, Dr. Joanna Duffy, Lana Marin, Stephen Weiber, Patrick Paul Walsh, and Amber Webb. The position paper is completing editorial review at the moment, and a zero draft will be able for consultation very soon, possibly later this week, I believe. So. First of all, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and we're very honored to have Sharon Memes here. Sharon has been Secretary General and CEO of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, um, in June, she joined in June 2023. Sharon's background is in international cultural relations and higher education. She's a passionate internationalist and speaks several languages. She spent most of her career with the British Council and held senior leadership roles in Europe, North America and Africa, promoting UK education and culture. And she's also worked for a range of organisations as a consultant in international strategy. Prior to joining IFLA, Sharon was Chief Operating Officer at the Association of Commonwealth Universities. And I'm going to invite Sharon now. The starting point today is really the belief that libraries are one of the world's most under leveraged assets. Um, so I'm really delighted that at IFLA, we've been working with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network on this position paper, which shows the contribution libraries can make to education for sustainable development and the SDGs more broadly. So I really want to first thank Neve and Paul for, for really the outstanding work that they've done. And it's always great to see people from outside of the library field who really get the importance and the role and the potential of libraries. So let me talk a little bit about IFLA and what we do. We are the global voice of libraries. It sounds very simple, but we help the library field to learn, share, develop good practice. We are the go-to organization for international professional standards. But we don't just work with librarians in the library field. We sometimes push them out of their comfort zone and many of them are very, very happy to be pushed because IFLA also acts as a bridge to others. And we want others to see libraries differently. So whether we're partnering with the UN, UNESCO, governments, universities, SDSN or other international organizations of influence, we want them to say, wow, I'd never thought about libraries in that way. So yes, we want others to see libraries differently, not just as the nice to have, but as powerful, professional, trusted and ethical actors in a broader ecosystem. And this is why the SDGs are such a powerful thinking and planning framework about sustainable development and for libraries. It gives us that shared language, the common way of talking about sustainable development, 
It's the language of governments. It helps our libraries have that conversation about libraries' contribution. It's incredibly powerful as a language of partnerships around development. And I think the other point is that, of course, the SDGs are relevant for everyone everywhere. Even if some governments tend to think that they're only for other parts of the world, they are relevant everywhere, everywhere. And one of the huge, um, I think, real, if you like, strengths of the libraries is that libraries are brilliant at understanding and responding to the needs of the very diverse communities they serve across the world. So that framework is absolutely brilliant in helping them respond best to their, their communities. And I talked about bridges, but how do we build these bridges? between libraries and other actors in sustainable development? Well, we provoke, we stimulate debate, we produce evidence, and importantly, we work with brilliant partners. And of course, we give librarians the tools to plan and make the case for libraries. And do have a look at our library map of the world, at the amazing stories of impact against the SDGs our, our members have contributed. And just as a measure of that success, with our help, over 50% of the voluntary national reviews last year, highlighted the contribution of libraries to the delivery of the SDGs. But if we just focus on a narrow perception of libraries of something you know we knew when we were a child or as a parent, we miss out on huge possibilities for partnerships that can help achieve goals. And appreciating and demonstrating that potential is really what Neve and Paul have done so brilliantly in the position paper. And I'm not going to summarize or extract, I'm going to let them <laughs> talk about it and obviously for you to read it but it does make a really convincing case for more work with libraries. And to pick up on some aspects that I think we can draw on more broadly, and while we can view education for, for sustainable development from a narrower perspective, i.e. sort of learning about the 2030 agenda or the themes within it, we can also view it more broadly as all the ways in which learning helps us to get closer to deliver on the agenda. And of course, this is the key point for libraries. It's what we've always done. We help people turn information and knowledge into real world outcomes. And in an age of disinformation and misinformation, trusted and professional librarians are worth their weight in gold. We're seeing some positive steps in recent work at the UN. For example, the guidelines on information integrity underline just how important it is to have access to accurate, reliable and verifiable information. Work around UN 2.0 makes better knowledge management a priority. The draft Pact for the Future stresses how vital it is to boost science policy interfaces that make a reality of evidence-based policy making. And increasingly, there's recognition that just having a connection to the internet is not enough. We need meaningful connectivity. And these are all areas where libraries have a huge amount to contribute if we make the links. It's also a call for a more coherent and purposeful approach to knowledge in the 2030 agenda. And so what do we hope from this position paper? Firstly, as I've already said, getting the world to see libraries differently. And Neve and Paul have done an amazing job there. And I'm sure there are many more opportunities. Secondly, action. And this report makes clear that no one should be asking themselves, why work with libraries? Instead, they should be saying, why on earth aren't we working with libraries? And finally, I hope that this can be the first of many such efforts, underlining the huge potential of libraries that challenge the idea of what libraries are, and in doing so, challenge stakeholders across the board to think about what more we can do together. And I just want to close by sharing the vision of IFLA's new strategy, which will be launched in October. And it is sustainable futures for all through knowledge and information. The SDGs will remain a critical framework for IFLA and libraries. Libraries represent a pre-existing, versatile, trusted and inclusive infrastructure for delivering development at all levels, alone or in partnership with others. Work with us. I look forward to future partnerships. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Shara. That was wonderful. And thank you so much for being so succinct and such a powerful call to action for working with libraries. Our next speaker is Zainab Varoglu. Zainab is Programme Specialist in the Digital Innovation and Transformation section of the Communications and Information section at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. She's responsible for the implementation of the UNESCO OER recommendation and the related OER Dynamic Coalition and the UNESCO ICT Competency Framework for Teachers, as well as initiatives in open, distance, flexible and online education. She was co-responsible officer for the publication Learning for All, guidelines for the inclusion of learners with disabilities in open and distance learning, and the UNESCO officer for the development of the UNESCO COL guidelines for open educational resources in higher education. So we're delighted that Zainab is here with us today. Zainab, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this discussion. It's a great honor. I would like to just take this uh, this time to share with you some uh, initiatives that we have been discussing with UNSDSN and with and uh, also IPLA has been in the discussions on uh, how we can bring together OER and uh, sustainable education for sustainable development. Now I am going to do something here. I hope I don't offend anybody, but I am going to give a definition of OER because one of the issues is that there's often, just to be crystal clear, we're really talking about openly licensed educational resources that are available on an open license or in the public domain that allow for access, reuse, repurposing, adaptation, and redistribution. We're not talking about free resources at all. I'm saying this now just as a, on automatic because this is something that has been in most, in I don't think in this forum, but in many fora, there is a lot of confusion about this. And it's really important because I think this fora really understands who we are and understands the value of the open license. So um, within this framework, uh, we have been working very closely with, with UNSDSN for several years. And through, uh, for example, I think many of you are aware of our cooperation for the for the tests in 2022, in which uh, we were part of the SDG Academy, the, uh, the session organized by SDG Academy, and we which looked at OER repositories and highlighted the importance of creating diamond OERs that are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable that are fast. And within this, we developed the discussion further to develop a a, a project to see how we can operationalize this. And the idea would be to, um, to develop a, a system in which platforms could be, uh, could be really harnessed for sharing, uh, sharing resources on ESD. And then there's the technical aspects, which I think we will go into more. And the, those would be about how they would work and how they would be designed in terms of a platform. And then we have the, part where UNESCO would also look at how the 2019 recommendation on OER could be could be used to, to as a force to provide capacity building and community building for these platforms. So technically this would be about um, how we could look at uh, capacity building and policy guidelines on 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 uh, strategizing the recommendation which has uh, five areas of activity capacity building policy, uh, inclusiveness and uh, multilingualism, sustainability and international collaboration into this these platforms in order to have the um, to have the uh, first of all guidelines to replicate the process done it within this project and second of all to have a community around the project. So this would be uh, in terms of the guidelines what we would be talking about would be to review the lessons learned in developing each platform to turn them into some sort of training manual and then to publicize and disseminate this within the target group and to build this together with the community of users that are actually working on the on the development of this uh, platform. And the value of this is to have a human element behind it, some sort of community that functions to keep it uh, uh, that to to have the discussions uh, and the the growth and the discussions growing around it and also in one space and also in another to be able to replicate the same process in other areas in other platforms in order and then 
perhaps to even be able to link and grow the different platforms with the interoperability. It's basically a multiplier effect that we're looking for. Um, the cre creation of a community of practice is something we've done at UNESCO a lot in terms of our activities, and it's very useful. We have the dynamic coalition. We are dynamic coalition, which you're aware of. We have a community of practice around the ICT competency framework for teachers. And what's important is that when you have a technical platform or a technical instrument, to be able to give voice to those users and those that, that work to further develop these tools, to be able to bring it to life and to be able to talk about how it actually works in a contextualized process. And I think here our partnerships with IFLA and with the with other uh, stakeholders is really important because the ideas are good, the platforms are good, but we need people and we need to work about work in different contexts and to be able to share the contextualization in this regard. Now we're uh, we're right now at the moment where we're taking this, this concept further and we're looking to launch it very soon. We're organizing the third UNESCO World OER Congress, which will be held in Dubai on the 19th and 20th of November. And this will be looking at three different uh, aspects. First of all, to take stock of the implementation of the recommendation on OER since it was adopted five years ago. And here, I think it would be interesting for this project to see how we can look at how the, the the points that we're discussing here about platforms, ESD, and the sustain and the 2030 UN agenda have developed since it was uh, since the adoption of the recommendation, and what the recommendation and OER can do to support the work that's ongoing in the area of ESD. Second of all, we're looking at emerging technologies and AI and how it responds to providing to, well, there are challenges of course to OER, especially particularly to licensing and issues related, but also how it can be harnessed to make, uh, make um, to, to drive the implementation of the recommendation further in terms of uh, different aspects, for example, uh, automatic translation, crypto security for tracing OER, et cetera. The third area is to look at collaborations, international collaboration between different stakeholders. And I think this project is a wonderful, um, wonderful example of what is possible. And I would like to invite you all to please do come and take part in this discussion in November and to explore with you how the uh, discussions we're having today and in terms of the project that we're discussing also that will be launched at this event, uh, can be uh, can be synthesized and to make a serious impact, a real impact on bringing forward the 2030 sustainable development agenda. So I think I've used my time, I'm not sure, but I think I have. Yes, you have. Thank you very much, Zeynep, for that, but you got across some very important information, in particular that really exciting event in uh, November in Dubai. So um, maybe somebody can post a link. I'll try and do it maybe later on into the chat here and welcome all the, the people who have just joined us. And um, please put your chat and your questions into the chat if you have any, and we'll have time for a discussion later on. So our next speaker um, is Meg Wacha. Um, and Meg serves as the scholarly communications officer and coordinator of the Library Publishing and Partnerships Unit at the UN Dag Hammarskjöld Library. They're committed to advancing equitable access to information and publishing systems through their dual roles in libraries and the Wikimedia movement. And most recently they found, served as the university scholarly communications librarian for the City University of New York where they led open research initiatives across 25 colleges and 31 libraries. Meg is the recent past president of Wikimedia NYC and has served on advisory boards for Library and Information Studies Scholarship Archives, that's LISSA, Wikimedia DC, CUNY Academic Commons, and that's an open source uh, social networking tool, and the International Open Access Week. Meg is also visiting Assistant Professor at the Pratt School of Information. So thank you for joining us, Meg. And I'm looking forward to your contribution to this. Over to you. Thank you so much, Neve, And thank you to everyone joining us today. The Dag Hammarskjöld Library, the flagship library of the United Nations, was established in 1946, just a year after the UN itself. And it was established because the General Assembly recognized that a library was needed in order 
to enable the delegations, secretariat, and other official groups of the organization to obtain the information needed in the execution of their duties. Then and now, the library connects member state delegations, UN staff, researchers, and in this internet connected world, global citizens with UN knowledge. In 2018, the library consolidated fragmented online resources into a central public access repository, the United Nations Digital Library, which freely shares UN documents, publications, speeches, maps, and gray literature. The metadata that describes each of these works is freely available for download, making the rich bibliographic work of the library's catalogers and indexers, including voting data and UN-specific ontologies, available for further research and use. Publications produced by the UN system, and which, you know, just in the past two weeks, publications have included original research on artificial intelligence, vaccines, risks faced by refugees and migrants, access to medical devices, SDG localization, the list goes on. These publications are freely available to inform delegations and UN staff in their work, and to provide global citizens with trusted, verifiable information they can read and use in their daily lives. Because there is this beautiful moment when open research doubles as open education, whether it's used by an instructor developing their next lesson, a student working on an assignment, or lifelong learners applying it to their jobs, to their daily lives. And whether organized around an entity such as the UN, a discipline, an institution, a funder, a geographic region, open and public repositories are the platform, platforms through which open science and scholarship circulates. They ensure that global citizens have access to verifiable information now and in the long term. And the Doug Homer Gold Library facilitates the sharing of UN publications and documents via its repository, but it also facilitates open science and scholarship more broadly as the convener of the biennial UN Open Science Conference in cooperation with the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Division of Sustainable Development Goals, UNESCO's Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building, and SPARC. The conference brings together researchers, policymakers, librarians, IGOs, publishers, and members of civil society, both online and in person at the UN headquarters in New York, to engage in a dialogue about the opportunities and challenges of practicing open science, as defined by the UNESCO recommendations on open science. Open science is recognized as the enabling environment for the achievement of all SDGs. And it's not just about accessing the final research product. It's a multiplicity of practices informed by an established set of values and principles. And as noted in the Global Open Science Outlook released by UNESCO, and I quote, the cultural shift to open science will only be possible with adequate monitoring of its impacts, including its possible unintended consequences for science and society unintended consequences that if it not addressed proactively may increase existing inequities. And so as we work towards a global knowledge commons for the SDGs, are there lessons to learn from the open science movement, including from the unintended consequences that have emerged? The Global Sustainable Development Report, uh, 2023 states that a shift to open science can change how research is done, who is involved and how it is valued. And this should be understood as part of a broader relationship between science and society. The UNESCO recommendations envision an equitable, fair and reciprocal access to science for all producers and consumers of knowledge, regardless of their location, nationality, race, age, gender, income, socioeconomic circumstance, career stage, discipline, language, religion, disability, ethnicity, migratory status, or any other grounds. So this is really about everyone being a part of a knowledge commons, both as consumers and producers of that knowledge. However, when researchers at Simon Fraser University recently analyzed a set of 52 open science policy documents, they, th they found that the documents overwhelmingly focused on making research outputs publicly accessible, but they did not adequately capture the ethos of open science and particularly its goal of making science more collaborative, inclusive, and socially engaged. That is, there weren't there wasn't concrete guidance on how to promote public participation. And so I turned to the words of the chief of the Doug Homer School Library, Thanos Giannakopoulos, who asks, what would it mean to have a global campaign for the right to read and the right to publish, especially in this world of quote unquote, publisher perish? 
And I ask, what would it mean to recognize the information imperialism of the present record and to make a conscious decision not to replicate it? What does an equitable and inclusive global science commons look like? What is the infrastructure required to support it? How can we move away from the private control of digital infrastructures with profit-driven interests and towards a global knowledge commons, one that is owned and governed by those who contribute to it, one that supports the public good and facilitates the achievement of the SDGs? One of the successes of open access, open science and scholarship is the federated, decentralized, primarily community owned and operated network of research repositories that freely share the world's collective knowledge and that do so in a way that unlike large commercial entities protects user data and their human rights. The Doc Hammer School Library not only operates a research repository, my colleagues have also developed an SDG taxonomy that can be used to apply SDG metadata to research output, connecting research related to the SDGs and making it more discoverable. A beta application linked SDG was developed to showcase the usefulness of adopting semantic web technologies and linked open data principles for extracting SDG related metadata from documents and establishing the connections among various SDGs. So basically taking a whole bunch of research articles and identifying which SDGs they would contribute to. And in order to ensure their fullest possible use, the identifiers in a formal statement of adoption was presented at the second regular session of the UN System Chief Executives Board for Coordination, and the Secretary General invited all UN organizations to use them. And these can be adopted and used by libraries worldwide, libraries that support both researchers, educators, and learners, and the works that they wish to share. Because in order to address the shared global threats in front of us, it is imperative that we share our shared global knowledge. Thank you. Meg, thank you so much. Um, I wasn't, I was, should have stopped you about a minute ago, but I couldn't because what you were doing was what you were saying was just so compelling. You've just summed up, I think, everything that we mean about the global knowledge commons. And I hope people are going to get involved and start to, to discuss this later on. But very but first, um, we are again, we have uh Dr. Daisy Selamatsela, who is the university librarian at the Unity, uh, University of Witwatersrand, known as Wits University, coming to join us. And uh, Daisy um, is an exceptional librarian and, and she is known as that. You can see various blog posts acknowledging this. She's by no means what people might think about as the usual librarian, if there is such a thing. Daisy was previously Executive Director of Library and Information Services in the University of South Africa and UNISA and Acting Vice Principal for Research and Innovation and Executive Director of Knowledge Management Corporate at NRF. She's appointed Professor of Practice of Knowledge Management at the University of Johannesburg and is Vice President, that's 2023 to 27, of the International Science Council, ISC, Executive Committee Member of the Committee on Data, that's co-data of the International Science Council. Daisy has served on policy forums such as the UNESCO Science Sector, South Africa National Commission for UNESCO Forum, Executive Member, um, International Council for Science Union, Ad Hoc Committee on Information and Data, ICSU EDC Panel, the International Science Union World Data Center Panel. And Daisy's role in academic citizenship involves serving on international boards of director of CoData, as we mentioned, Research for Life, Get FTR, Networks and Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertations, that's the NDLTD. And she has previously served on the boards of both ORCID and CORE, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. And it's worth mentioning that at national level, DAISY serves on the board of directors of ITOCA, that's Information Training and Outreach Center for Africa, SANLIC, South African National Licensing Core and Consortium. She's the chair of both CHELSA, the Committee of Higher Education Librarians of South Africa and the South African National Committee of CODATA, as we mentioned. Um, she served on a number of important editorial boards and is the recipient of a number of international awards, including the 2016 and 2019 Knowledge Management Leadership Award by the Global Knowledge 
Management Congress and Awards in association with the World Education Congress. So, Daisy, as I've said, we are um, it's it's wonderful that you can join us here today. We're all really looking forward to your contribution to this. So over to you. Thank you, colleagues, and good afternoon from South Africa. I just have a bout of flu, but uh, I'll proceed. Thank you very much. From my side, I just want to share what we do uh, as part of, uh, from the academic library side of ensuring that we drive the SDG agenda, and in particular, looking at the IFLA motto regarding sustainable uh, uh, futures for all. And uh, that's what I'm going to be sharing with you. I'm from the University of the Witwaters Rand, based in Johannesburg. And why it's called the Witwaters Rand is because where the library and the university is based, we are on the hub of where gold was mined in Johannesburg. And we host uh, the largest collection of mining and mining resources in our libraries and our archives based on the history of the city in South Africa. Having said that, our university when it comes to SDGs, part of the university strategy, 2030 strategy, embraces SDGs. And I would highlight the thematic areas that are embraced as part of our uh, uh, statement for the 2030 strategy. Our university embraces SDG 3, that highlights on health and well being, SDG 4, that looks at decent work and environmental growth uh, and economic growth, SDG 10, that focuses on reduced inequalities, and especially because of the location of the university in the city center, and SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities, like I have related, because of the populace around the university where we have lots of, uh, for now, homelessness, lots of uh, street kids and so forth because of the migration into Southern Africa and South Africa and everybody wants to go to the city of gold. So that's why we're looking at sustainable cities and uh, communities. And also lastly, SDG 17, which focuses on partnership uh, for, the, uh, for, for, for the good. And this is what, as the institution, we are looking at to say, whatever, if you are from the academic side, what do you do with regards to partnerships around institutions and bodies that are looking at embracing and ensuring that uh, we achieve the sustainable development goals? Having said that, I would want to bring it now closer to home as libraries to say, as an academic library, what do we do to ensure that we are leading in our space, in our institution, especially that the university embraces the issues around uh, SDGs. We have, as part of our support, we are lucky that our university has a pro vice chancellor who focuses on climate, sustainability, and, in and inequality. And that actually assists us in ensuring that our voice is heard because this position of the pro vice chancellor plays a major role, but with us from the academic library, we saw an edge to say this is our competitive edge. We need to go out there and make sure that academics, students, and postgrads actually understand the role of the library and any other worker. What are we all about when it comes to sustainable development goals and look at the, uh, the UN goals also? So from the library side, the action that I want to highlight is that uh, we appointed for the first time as part of our library restructuring or organizational redesign, we make a point that as part of our structure, we appoint an SDG metadata or catalog, catalog and librarian who will focus on ensuring that SDGs are part of the component of what of the work that we do, and it's just not just lip service. And the role of this cataloger also links to our colleagues who are in the institutional repository side to ensure that whatever it's collected and curated from the cataloging side also gets harvested uh, into the institutional repository. And what also what we do, we link as part of our information literacy instruction for our undergraduate students, and in particular, our postgraduate students, our researchers, and our post uh, postdocs, we push the agenda of when you publish or when you write your articles, are you focusing on the SDGs? And that's what our research librarians are pushing on every time when we do our orientation, information literacy instruction, we push this agenda to say, 
Can you ensure that as part of your, uh, your outputs, what you are looking at, your themes, ensure that you drive the SDG agenda? And we have seen traction in that regard because then that linkage and what we uh, harvest from that uh, side with the academic outputs, then we collate this data and that gets submitted also to the university central office where they can see what we're actually doing. And that was an idea that was never before there before, but for the past year, we've seen traction in that regard and also with the metrics that we want embedded in that. And fast forward to that, what has actually elevated us is that for now, for the first time, the library is actually involved in the performance review, annual performance review of all our faculties annual performance review of all our faculties and we're starting the first engagement on the 18th of July and we had to submit to the faculties what we expect them and also the metrics that we picked up from our repository and also with our engagements because they have to highlight what they are contributing with regards to SDGs and for us it's a you know it's a nugget for us to say we are now recognized to say we want to see the library being in the forefront of academic performance reviews on an annual basis. And that's what that's the uh, positive side. And coming to capacity building, because you can't talk about SDGs without capacity building. Also from the library side, we also look at social justice. How do we actually ensure social cohesion as librarians? And how do we do that on the ground? We have then partnered with our department, the University Department of Marketing and Corporate Communications. In the beginning, it used to be about, oh, you know, the library has these books and you are celebrating certain events like Workers' Month. May month was Workers' Month. One of the things that we used to do previously and this year was to make uh, our University Corporate Communications and Marketing aware of books that workers, and when we say workers, we're focusing now about academics, but now we're looking at our general workers who are manning our grounds, who are cleaning our offices across our 11 campuses and so forth. And we will then have books that are on display that our workers, general workers can know, oh, I have access to this book, I can use this book and so forth. And that gets publicized by our the University Corporate and Communications Marketing. The other big thing that we have done, which is a, also a feather or a cap on the, for the university, is that we had to train as part of this partnership with uh, our corporate communications and marketing of the university. We trained in total 177 gardeners, cleaners, and security personnel attended our trainings around the campuses where they are based, because we have uh, 11 libraries that are based in three campuses, and they attended a training that was then facilitated by our librarians who were actually showcasing and also training uh, these uh, workers what libraries are all about and what they can do and what they can achieve out of being in, in, uh, in the spaces, because we have our cleaners who work in the libraries, who clean our libraries, but don't even have a clue what's happened. They just see books and they dust and whatever. And the ultimate goal was for them to be able to understand what the role of libraries are. And the surveys that came out and the questions that came out of those engagements were quite an eye opener. For example, one of the main questions which we are implementing as management to say, we need to change this. Their first complaint was when we come to libraries and we just ask at the desk, at the information desk or I desk, what do you do here? The staff would normally say, it's none of your business. Why do you want to know? And we discover that in some points, service points, we have non-professionals who are manning those points. So they don't understand their role there. And they are only seeing this cleaner, for example, or gardener trying to find something from them, maybe they're trying to ridicule them or whatever, that's their thoughts. And we have now started changing that aspect to say, we need professional librarians at our information desks and whoever is not a professional librarian must go behind the scenes because of these kinds of nuances that we picked up. And we are looking forward to engaging more with our ground workers within the university in ensuring that they understand and they can actually also pursue their studies further with the understanding of what the library is there for. And of recent, we also have uh, 
a request from uh, the, one of the mining houses to co collaborate with them in the city center, to collaborate with them to come up with sort of a, a public library, but it's an academic library in the city center where we can then be involved in that library to ensure that it caters the needs of the community around the city and not just our students, because we also have students who are based in the city, who live in the city, but then commute and walk to main campus. And in this request from this young engineer, who's an alumni of the university, wants us to partner with them in establishing that library in the city center, but to cater also for the citizens in the city center and not just uh, uh, students who are studying only with my university, and we are looking into that process. And we see that as part of adding value and contributing to the SDGs. And I just want to highlight to uh, colleagues who are with us here that the roadwork and the path that we are taking for SDGs is not for somebody out there, like if you have to say, what are you going to do for me as a librarian to ensure that I implement uh, SDGs? The 17 of them, we do them on a daily basis. Like I said, as part of social cohesion, us as librarians, we need to be stepping ahead of the time and saying, this is what we do. We need to show with our actions and not wait and say, what are you doing for me? Because that's the ambit now where people are saying, but if not has this, you know, library map of the libraries and so forth, and what are, what are we waiting for something? We need to be embracing and saying, what are we doing in this, our sl small little pockets? We look at the students who come to our universities. They come from marginalized communities. They see the library for the first time when they visit a university library. And that's my scenario in Southern Africa. In South Africa, that our students in rural villages, in the cities, they only see libraries when they go to university. And that's part of us contributing and mitigating as part of social justice, as part of a building capacity, and we need to come with programs on how we address that. Daisy. And I'm, I want also want to highlight that uh, thank you very much, and we are building partnerships and also presentations with people with similar intent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daisy. Sorry for interrupting at the end there, and I disappeared from my internet crashed for a few moments, so apologies for that. So we're, we're going to move on. Um, Quite quickly um, after that great intervention and contribution from, from Daisy to Masood Kokar. So Masood is the university librarian and keeper of the Brother, Brotherton Collection at University of Leeds. And he's a founder member of the Knowledge Equity Network with colleagues in the University of Leeds and the University of Pretoria. Uh, Masood recently took on the additional responsibility of Director of Learning Spaces to develop the strategic delivery program for learning spaces at the University of Leeds. He joined the University of Leeds in 2021, having worked in senior roles in the private sector and higher education, including in the Bodleian Libraries, uh, University of Oxford, Lancaster University, and the University of York. A computer scientist by education, Masud is passionate about digital leadership and innovation in the changing library and archive environments. His core interests cut across the topics of strategic leadership, digital transformation, user experience, learning, spaces, innovation, cultures, open education and research, and staff talent realization. He's been a keynote speaker on these topics in several leading national and international conferences. Masud is current chair of RLUK, that's Research Libraries UK. It's a consortium of 39 leading and significant research universities in the UK and Ireland. He serves on the White Rose Libraries Executive Board and is an executive member of the Cambridge University Library Syndicate. And he provides guidance and support to the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council on research infrastructures. So, Masood, I'm looking forward to your presentation. I believe that you have slides, so please go ahead and share your screen now. Uh, thank you so much, Neve. I hope people can see my screen as well. Um, I'm hoping Neve can just give me a thumbs up. Yes. Yes, yes excellent. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this critical event on the importance of knowledge equity and towards a global knowledge commons. 
and I will share some of my thoughts on why this development is a key enabler for us to move ahead at pace with sustainable development goals. Um, I'm sure many folks here are familiar with the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and in particular, Article 27.1, which states that it is everyone's right to share in scientific advancement um, and to benefit from that scientific advancement as well. Uh, similarly, the UNESCO recommendation on open science acknowledges this and identifies open science as a key enabler for achieving this human right. And also, um, and it was mentioned earlier, UNESCO recommendation on open educational resources affirms the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights particularly Article 19, to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media, uh, and regardless of frontiers. And Article 26.1, which is that everyone has the right to education. But I think it's important to recognize that in reality, we are still far away from achieving these aims. Um, I would go as far to say that we have not enabled knowledge for all and we have not succeeded in equitable application of knowledge for sustainable development goals. Uh, Zanab earlier highlighted the importance of local and contextualized development of open educational resources. I think that localized co-production of knowledge is such a critical element and we've not yet got that right. Uh, but there are also really deep and important questions which require critical thinking on the knowledge ecosystem. So who creates the knowledge in the first place? Who has access to this knowledge? Who benefits from this knowledge? And is the knowledge locally applicable? And there are lots of reasons of why I believe those are really important questions because at this time, and particularly being a university librarian here in the UK, I often feel that we look at knowledge from a very Western lens and not a global lens. And I think it's really critical that we change that uh, in order for us to achieve global outcomes. Uh, there are also real dangers associated with uh, big or elite or research intensive universities claiming that they have all the knowledge or all the answers. Being from a big Russell Group top 100 university, I think it is absolutely important for us to acknowledge that we don't have all the answers. And actually we need to work together to get to those answers. And I quite often say the hint is in the name. These are global challenges, and the only way to solve them is through globally applicable solutions. But in order to get that right, we need to get the knowledge ecosystem right first. This is what takes me to the Knowledge Equity Network and why we have developed it with particularly co-partnership with the University of Pretoria, but also why it's so critical and where it can lead to a, a more prosperous future. So firstly, let me talk a little bit about Knowledge Equity Network from a higher education perspective, and then I will talk a little bit more about it from a library's perspective. So Knowledge Equity Network, more importantly, has fairness at its core. So while it has a significant focus on equitable access to knowledge, it also recognizes that fairness also requires equitable co-production of knowledge. Uh, appreciating different knowledge systems and their importance in localized context. It is also critical that we work together to solve this. And one of the principles behind Knowledge Equity Network is radical collaboration. It really pushes us away from thinking about com competition. There is always a little bit of competition across universities, but I think what it talks about is our purpose. We are here and I'm, I'm it's going to sound a bit ideological, but we are here to change the world. We can't do that by competing. That requires radical collaboration. For this reason, Knowledge Equity Network believes in four key principles. Knowledge should be universal. Knowledge production and access should be collaborative. Knowledge should be inclusive. And knowledge should be sustainable. It brings to its forefront a commitment to open science, open education, and open infrastructures working in partnership with all parts of the world, and also in order to change the world more positively. As I said, it might seem ideological, but nothing great in this world comes by thinking small. I think we need to think big and bold to actually make a real difference. 
This also takes me then to the role of libraries. So libraries have always had a strong sense of responsibility to leave no one behind. And knowledge is also a core mission of all libraries. Libraries are also trusted entities. They are key social infrastructures, often providing warm spaces and access to internet in, in infrastructures or communities where that's not easily available, and also provide global trusted infrastructure for a distributed knowledge ecosystem. All the key ingredients are there, they've just not been used in that way. So, and particularly from an academic library's perspective, we have already been highly engaged in open science, open research and open education, but we are still looking at it from a Western lens. Let me give a couple of examples and then I'll try to conclude this. So, for example, uh, within the UK, and I would say argue even in Europe, we have been looking at policies around open science, open research, open access to publications, but they have all moved us away from one set of inequities to another set of inequities. That is still not a globally equitable knowledge publishing landscape. It has improved open access to knowledge, but at a consequence of publishing. Similarly, I would argue that we are not yet fully mature in developing open educational infrastructures. And I think there's a lot more work to do. Let me also add the lovely words of generative AI in this conversation. It is creating new opportunities, but it's also creating new threats. And those threats are really, really interesting, particularly on the topics of how would knowledge be authenticated in the future? What, how would we trust knowledge? What would be the elements of knowledge equity and what knowledge would be preserved for our future generations? Meg mentioned both the right to global publishing, but also the unintended consequences. And those are quite rife with generative AI. Daisy mentioned SDG literacies and the importance of that and building it in the local processes. We know that like any other technology, AI can be a great leveler. It can help us reach better accessibility. It can help us generate translations of content in many, many different languages. It can help connect our communities with knowledge, but it can also create a significant risk or threat, particularly who controls AI. Which knowledge is it being built on? Knowledge monopolization. So there's a significant risk and opportunity here which the libraries can help with, particularly through trusted shared infrastructures and through a renewed focus on information, digital media, AI, and SDG literacies. My very last comment around this is that in our day-to-day -day practice, libraries are actively involved in all stages of developing a local knowledge commons. We look after our local knowledge infrastructures, we look at governance, academic partnerships, standards, we develop communities around knowledge. And those communities trust us. Through Knowledge Equity Network, but also through the launch of this position paper, I would argue that we have a great opportunity to reposition the libraries from developing rich local knowledge systems to be able to move that to a rich global knowledge commons. SDG 17 highlights the need and importance of the partnerships we need to develop. And this is what Knowledge Equity Network is all about, but it is also what the aim and mission of a global knowledge commons is. And I would personally stress that the time to act is now. I hope this has given you some thoughts, uh, some of my thoughts around this topic. I look forward to any questions that might come later today. And if you're interested, please do visit the Knowledge Equity Network website. There's a declaration over there. If you're interested, please sign that as an individual or as an organization. We are here to support you in this process and look, for, look forward to working with you to shape this world in a more positive way. Thank you. Thanks very much, Masood. And we're running a little short on time now. So I'm going to go straight over to Ramuna um, Patukovaite, who works for Eiffel. Uh, Ramuna is um, the Eiffel Public Library Innovation Program Manager. She's responsible for the de development, delivery, and ev evaluation of a range of activities contributing to community development through public libraries in Eiffel focused geography, that is, developing and transition economy countries. In addition, Ramuna has contributed to the build out of a framework for public librarians' capacity building for digital inclusion efforts. And I know there's been a few questions here in the chat about, about digital inclusion, about you know, um, significant levels of illiteracy. Um, in Africa and other countries. So Ramona might be able to address some of this. 
She's le led IFL's Digital Capacity Building Initiatives for public librarians in several partner countries in Africa, including Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, Uganda and others. And um, before joining IFL, she was Chief Specialist at the Division of Information Society Development of the Ministry of Culture in the Republic of Lithuania. So she was responsible for the implementation of a state-funded library and re renovation and modernization uh, program. Um, so I'm going to go straight over to you, Ramona, and I'm going to remind you of the time, five to six minutes, please. And um, over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neith, for introduction and hello to everyone from Lithuania. Um, I'm really honored to be part of the discussion and as glad to pitch in public libraries uh, as a partner in ongoing and community-centered education for sustainable development. Uh, first, I, I'll speak about uh, Eiffel. Um, Oh, it takes time to change slides. <laughs> okay, first I speak about Eiffel. So Eiffel is a not-for-profit organization that partners with library consortia and libraries to enable access to knowledge for education, research, learning, and live local livelihood de development. Um, Eiffel currently works with library consortia in 40 developing and transition economy countries in Africa, Asia, Pacific, and Europe, representing more than 3,000 libraries. Uh, we work through four core programs, Eiffel Licensing Program, Eiffel Open Access Program, Eiffel Cop and Copyright, Eiffel Copyright and, and Libraries Program and Public Library Innovation Program that I represent here. Um, uh, I'll share just two uh, initiatives uh, that we implemented or I implementing with with libraries across uh, across world, uh, helping uh, to open access to research, uh, education, and learning. And uh, and those uh, two initiatives uh, were implemented under two different programs. First, Eiffel Open Access Program. It's uh, probably the oldest pro program of Eiffel um, that uh, actually works for removing barriers to knowledge uh, sharing by supporting open access and open science policy work at national and institutional levels. Uh, we also support access, uh, open access journals and repositories in our partner countries and, and open science and open research skills building. Um, we organize train the trainers activities, create training materials and advocate for research in incentives and structures that support and promote the acquisition of of open science and open research skills. We develop these resources and activities with our network of open science trainers librarians from Armenia, Botswana, Georgia, Ghana, Ethiopia, Lithuania, Malawi, Palestine, Serbia, Slovenia, Ukraine, and so on and so on. And actually librarians are really uh, have very much taken in the lead of their effort to create openly available training materials for use in education and training for sustainable development. And on the open access program in two Eiffel, together with Creative Commons and Spark, started open climate campaign that promotes open access to research uh, to accelerate uh, to accelerate progress towards solving climate crisis and preserving global biodiversity. If we are going to solve these global challenges, the knowledge, research data, educational resources, software about them must be open. And as we all know, this is not the case uh, yet. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this, uh, this campaign, please visit the uh, website, which is openclimatecampaign.org. Uh, and another 
case that I want to highlight today is uh, is very different, and it's it's about uh, public libraries and our most recent uh, project that we completed in Uganda in 2023. Um, the project that was implemented with several partners and local uh, partners uh, aimed at uh, enable Ugandan youth and women to participate in digital society by providing them with basic di digital and mobile literacy skills and access to meaningful online content through public and community libraries. Uh, during uh, two and a half years of the, implementing the project, 27 local libraries provided basic digital skills training to over uh, 6,500 people from every walks of life, including single mothers, street vendors, business women, unemployed youth teachers, uh, border border drivers, health, healthcare workers, and so on. Um, uh, even more people were reached through very short outreach visits, uh, visits to community places, marketplaces, schools, uh, public institutions, and so on. And what is really more important and, and actually step uh, further from just training digital skills or providing digital skills is that Public librarians were facilitators of uh, learning circles uh, uh, using digital, uh, open, and free educational resources, and they reached uh, over 1,500 individuals with, with different online courses on digital subjects, but also on practical skills. Uh, and, and those new skills really enabled youth and women to harness uh, digital opportunities for education and development through informal employment or starting new micro enterprises in the marketplace or, or improving their business, adding some digital services uh, in, uh, in a very rural areas uh, for, for communities. And here is just the one example how how public libraries in Uganda, um, uh, one public library in Uganda helped uh, uh, local businessmen. So he says that at the library training, I learned how to search the internet, and I I am now using these skills to find information on how to repair computer equipment like screens, extension cables, computer mice, and domestic items like irons. This gives me a chance to generate extra income from the items that I repair. So this is just one example, and there are really many examples from those 27 libraries across Uganda that really helped people to uh, get get better in their lives and and, and improve their incomes and, uh, Sorry, and help also that. others. Yes. We've just run out of time. Would, would you be able to finish up? Yeah, that's, that's it, actually. Um, right. If you want to learn more about those impact cases, just uh, check out our uh, links. Thank you so much, Ramuna. That was great. And um, so obviously all of these slides will be made, avail made available and the recording will be available too. And so to our final speaker um, today, we have um, Professor Patrick Paul Walsh, um, who is the Vice President of um, Education and Director of the SDG Academy at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the SDSN. He's on secondment from University College Dublin, where he remains a full professor of International Development Studies, director of the UCD MSc in Sustainable Development in partnership with the SDT Academy. And he's president of the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. Um, Paul has held academic positions in Trinity College Dublin, KU Leuven, Harvard University and Columbia University, and has held positions in the United Nations European Commission. International Monetary Fund and World Bank, and his current focus is on sustainable development education that is informed by science, practice, and policy. Over to you, Paul.
Thank you, Neve, um, and uh, thanks for all the speeches. So I'll try, because I know people would like to ask questions, so I'll try and move on this. Um, if the slides would go down for me, here we go. So just briefly about the SDG Academy. Um, initially, we were producing MOOCs, our online courses, our open education uh, courses, um, which were very loyal to the SDGs in the sense that uh, when the issue that was addressed, we made sure we looked at the socio-economic and environmental dimensions and governance dimensions. And also we did a very much science policy practice interface. Um, and that's the 50 courses that are now available on a few platforms, but particularly edX. Um, the, what we realized though, having this content doesn't necessarily mean it gets used, particularly if it's up on a, what I call a curved technology like edX. Um, and we were, are starting just to think about how do we get these, let's call them collections, mobilized into universities and schools and corporates and government departments or the LMSs of these things. And that's where my experience with Neve on Diamond Publications or, or working with digital repositories and libraries, uh, my instinct was is that the digital library infrastructure uh, could be a very good way of disseminating uh, individual components of these kind of collections in, into different uses. Um, so we're 10 years old actually uh, at the moment and we've had a million users, which is, which is good. It's not of course 8 billion users, but it's a, a million users. Um, but we are working hard on this mobilization of content to degrees uh, professional training and obviously we're delighted to be in community of practice like we are here today um i suppose the ones that we're known most for is mission 4.7 uh, the mdp masters in development practice association program but also an important community for us now is uh, working with unesco on the oer implementation of the 2019 oer recommendation and we've also decided like today to get a bit more involved in advocacy and publications and blogs and events, you know, to really start screaming, uh, the world needs education, everyone needs to go to school, everyone needs to be involved in lifelong learning. But for that to happen, you have to have open resources um, and you have to make not only as the knowledge equity network are saying, not only everyone has the right to supply knowledge, uh, but you've also the right to access it and repurpose it and localized, et cetera in a global knowledge commons. And we are very far away from this, but actually we will not achieve the SD agenda if we do not uh, achieve this. Um, this is a little bowl now, just to give you an example of our latest course. Um, we, we've decided for our global classroom, which is open to everyone. Uh, a lot of schools flip it into for credit and into homeworks, but it's actually open for everyone to do. And this year, the backdrop will be the summit of the future. And of course, I'm a professor, so I gave some prior learning over the summer. Uh, and this course is now self-paced and open on edX called Revitalizing Multilateral for a Sustainable Future. And I take you through our common agenda, our Secretary General's common, our common, common agenda, uh, the 12 thematic policy briefs that back that up. Uh, and also I take you through uh, the Pact for the Future the Digital Compact and the Pact for Future Generations, which are now in revision one. Um, and I also back them up with academic talks and specialist talks um, uh, on each of each of the chapters. Um, so that's there if you want to scan it and it's free uh, and it's a seven week course. So just to get to the point of today, the Global Knowledge Commons and Sustainable Development, as an economist, we have this thing called the production possibility frontier, and this is about efficiency, but uh, I apply this to what I call the knowledge frontier for sustainable development. And I just ask the question, both across resource rich countries and, and unresourced countries, do we actually have the knowledge to implement the SDG agenda, all the transformations? And the answer is probably no, because if we look at our funding and the orientation of our research, sometimes it's towards security and military use, it's not actually towards sustainable development, right? So we actually have one problem where knowledge is not always free uh, to create, to create, and we need indigenous knowledge, knowledge and knowledge all across the world. It's, it's obviously not easy to access or reorientate towards the public good. 
Um, and one of the first things we've got to do in a, glo a global knowledge commons for the SDGs is actually to populate with knowledge for the SDGs from all over the world. The second thing that we're not doing is that it's very clear to me that every country has to go on a net zero pathway, has to start orientating towards the SDGs, but some countries actually uh, need open knowledge and open science and capacity. Um, and again, we have to transfer this knowledge across, across countries, which is a two-way flow. It's not that, as um, was said at my Masood in, in University of Leeds, uh, we don't know everything in the global north and we need a lot of knowledge to come in, indigenous knowledge and knowledge from SIDS etc about how to actually ha have net zero pathways and achieve the SDGs uh, but we do have a, a public uh, digital highway in the libraries and we do have the opportunity to actually put our knowledge to license it properly to tag it properly uh, to verify it properly and to actually transfer it with ease across all the public libraries this is something that we can do um, and then lastly it, when the when the knowledge or these collections are in the library, so we saw some examples there on from if uh, on the last speaker, um, where yes, you can do digital training, but in reality, uh, what we can see is that when that content is at that micro level and each object is actually licensed and, and uh, in a taxonomy and 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 can be repurposed and translated easily, it's much easier to push this into. Uh, digital libraries for parliaments or into libraries for in, in the LMSs of corporates or governments who are actually upskilling and reskilling people. And just to dream the dream a little bit, it is possible that once those uh, collections are there, those courses are there, we could start creating pathways, uh, certs and diplomas and micro-credentials into degrees. So it's not just that you can have the digital skills to actually contribute to the economy and to earn an income, which is important. But you know, across the, the, the you know the libraries across the world that have deep space or have this kind of capability, it is possible for people to come in and actually um, start their education, maybe do their baccalaureates, do university degrees, and all do it uh, from a library, um, and to do it online or even to do it from a refugee camp and so on. So there's no more excuses for, for in the sense that we need people to access education and knowledge. And with that, it is possible um, to actually deliver uh, teaching from, you know, at all levels of learning, including K-12 universities and lifelong learning. So that's basically the dream, but we need to populate the Global Knowledge Commons uh, with knowledge for the SDGs. We may need to make it as interoperable as possible and to be able to transfer it with ease across the libraries and to make it accessible as possible and repurposable as possible. Um, and if this is done, it's a great platform uh, for, as Zainab was pointing out, our World OER Congress that's happening with UNESCO in Dubai in November, and the sort of projects that are there saying, well, what can we do with Global Knowledge Commons for Mission 4.7, which is lifelong learning and training, if you like, on the SDGs, uh, but there's many other applications. Well, um, and time is up. Sorry. Just one point about the paper we wrote, um, and then I'll stop. So myself and Neve have a bit of history on what's Diamond publication, but we call it Diamond Engagement. And this position paper is going to be very much like that, which means that you really can't do this alone. You have to work with the governments, the academics, the tech providers, the users of this content. Um, uh, and to enable you and to incentivize you to be able to create these type of collections uh, and do uh, what we call diamond engagements and not just diamond publications. So I'll stop there. My time is up. Thanks very much, Paul, for, for that. And thank you, everybody, for all your contributions. So we don't have the time we thought we were going to have to, to um, discuss this but this is the beginning of a conversation, I think, and we'll have our position paper coming out soon. We can continue this conversation in a number of different fora. Um, thank you very much to all of you who have stayed with us today. We're going to take a look at some of the, the questions in the chat. We have just about 10 minutes left in our time. So I'm going to try and just summarize a little bit of what, what's been going on. There's still people joining us. Um, so um, 
Thank you to Zainab and Masood and to Meg who have been answering various different questions. So we won't go into those now and providing information that are there. There's an, I'm going to summarize a number of questions have our comments have come up saying things like um, uh, Sule Mane said in some parts of Africa, there's a non negligible proportion of illiterate people. It also concerns local languages. So there's this concern that's a, a reflected in a number of different language and uh, different questions about the digital divide and not just the digital divide, the educational divide, the, the educational inequity um, that is going on, a concern for local languages and for diversity. Um, and also I'm going to add in another question here because there is another one here about how can we persuade our policymakers to act upon this. So I'm going to put that to members of the panel um, to answer those questions or to come up with a commentary. First of all, what about the digital divide? What can we do about it um, in relation to this global uh, commons? And how do we protect diversity of languages and cultures and indigenous and knowledge systems while we're doing that. Big questions. We've got like 30 seconds per person to come up with that. So I'm going to start with Sharon um, in the order. Have you got a comment to make about that, Sharon? Um, I think, well, being, being brief, um, I think the digital divide is a huge one which is often ignored. And actually, that's where investment in libraries, whether within universities or uh, public libraries elsewhere, is tremendous because at least access can can be provided. But I think a 30 second comment on what I feel about that and done some research on that is, is a difficult one. Um, and it's one that, that we which is getting worse. Just in terms of diversity, language and cultures, that is so, uh, so huge. And, and, uh, you know, I know in my comments, having worked in, in India, uh, where there are just so many different languages and what you're trying to do to make sure that those values, those languages, particularly as I worked at the British Council, where everybody assumed I was pushing English, which absolutely we weren't. We were saying just the importance of recognising the value and having that first language, the different and diversity of languages. That's really, really important. And again, I think libraries can make a huge contribution to that because they can recognise that both the written and non-written ones. So I, you know, I think there are huge opportunities there. I mustn't forget it. Thank you, Sharon, for that. What about you, Zainab? Very digital. quick, yes, yeah. very quick. Just to let you know, last at the end of last year, we did a study on digital inclusion, and what came out of the study was libraries as the key points for supporting digital inclusion. And why? Because libraries have actually evolved a lot since the last twenty years in the digital. They have digitally transformed more than most people are aware, and it's uh, and they are actually centers. They're public. They are the equivalent of public of public schools except for knowledge. And there is a the largest network of knowledge centers in the world that are public are libraries. And the role of librarians is changed in, changed exponentially. And it's not for me to say here in a room full of librarians, but you are knowledge workers and you are curating knowledge and we have more knowledge. And we in terms of digital divide, you also even have the most of libraries are equipped with the resources. So if digital divide is is uh, is physical access to resources, then it's there. If it's training and using resources and accessing information, again, libraries. If it's access to the physical resources themselves, libraries again. And I think that it's, this is something that needs to be highlighted and screamed from every rooftop possible that libraries play a key role in digital in bridging the digital divide. Brilliant, Zaina. Thanks a million. Meg, have you got anything to add to this? I'm sure you do. Such wonderful comments thus far. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, and libraries really are, you know, enablers of technology within their communities. Um, and so I would point to, you know, emphasizing and building systems that prioritize access from a broad range of devices across a range of bandwidths, as opposed to um, acquiring or purchasing the most sparkling, cutting edge, you know, features and software. Um, and also, you know, there are so many, so many challenges around multilingualism at this particular moment, particularly in the ways in which the scholarly record uh, prioritize is English, as well as um, English language metadata, right? So that 
um, a lot of the, you know, existing research that is already out there in the world in a broad range of languages, right, is not visible um, because of the discovery systems that, that currently exist. So um, there is one of many starting points we could engage with. Excellent point. Thank you, Meg. Masood, what about you and the Knowledge Equity Network? Digital divide yeah, so yeah. I, I won't I won't say much about digital inclusion because colleagues have excellently summarized that. But what I would say is that I think we need to absolutely acknowledge and respect uh, the amount of knowledge systems that exist and the knowledge diversity and bibliodiversity that that brings. And I'll just highlight that uh, indigenous, local, and traditional knowledge systems are probably one of the largest bodies of human knowledge about biodiversity and ecosystems. We've seen amazing work in that knowledge system, using that knowledge system to improve climate conditions. And unless we have that body of knowledge richly embedded in the kind of solutions we create, we will be at a loss in my view. So I think that uh, acknowledgement and appreciation and full core development of knowledge systems would become really important. Thanks, Masood. That's great. Um, and Ramona, you're actually at the cutting edge of this, you know, so that in public libraries and Africa and other areas, in a couple of, you know, lines, could you kind of give a response to this? I know that's quite a large, large thing to ask. Yeah, it's difficult to really <laughs> make it in, in a few lines, but, uh, you know, there is the no miracle, just consistent advocacy and partnership builds understanding and draws the attention of governments to the need of developing the uh, ICT infrastructure in libraries, but also skills and build capacity in libraries to really make uh, build access or make accessible you know, knowledge resources that people need to to improve their lives. And, and I think this is very, very important. There are a lot of players around that libraries could uh, you know, cooperate uh, and, and arrange uh, stakeholders meeting, multi-stakeholders meeting in their countries just to advocate for and showcase what, what other, other libraries in uh, in other countries do. And in terms of uh, multiculturalism, diversity, you know, all systems should be, uh, should build deliberately um, uh, support to that. If we leave the content to be developed, uh, uh, you know, by those who have resources, definitely we will have the same result, like, uh, you know, Point. Uh, content coming from from the countries that that are more rich and more proactive and so on so we need to really have some kind of um, resources to support um, uh, content from yes. other parts of the world thanks Ramona and I just wanted to give Daisy Daisy would you summarize something you've got 30 seconds or just before we finish up would it be possible for you to give us your view on this question Yes, thank you. From my side, being from the global south, uh, it's quite important. It, what we are discussing today in the comments on the questions is more about political will and government support in recognizing life is as core to knowledge generation and, so, and, and social cohesion, also including social understanding through citizen science. It's quite important on the role of libraries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy. We could discuss this all day. Hopefully we'll continue to do that when we get the chance to come back and discuss our um, position paper as soon as it's released. I'm just going to give the final words to, uh, to Paul Walsh. Paul, would you like to give us an idea of where we're going from here? And thank you very much to everyone who participated and especially to all our speakers here today. Paul? Yeah, no. Um, so this position paper came out of our side event at the at the midpoint review or the SDG summit. Um, and I think it was just very important for the stakeholders. I mean, libraries, yes, to kind of take stock of what they could do and to dream, but actually for governments and academics and uh, all the, you know, uh, the technology folks, just everyone to just step step back and realize what an opportunity we have to partner with libraries to actually start delivering um, this content all over the world in a kind of global knowledge commons. Um, and of course, 
uh, one of its uses can be science policy interface, but an important use is actually to support uh, Mission 4.7 or education or lifelong learning or K-12 or into university. So where we are now is um, we will release the position paper later this week um, and we will have a Google form for people to give comments. So it's really zero draft and we're still going to have a consultative process. Um, then we will sit down um, with the partners and see what type of publication we'll produce. So it'll probably be an overarching publication where we might have an executive summary. Uh, we might have, you know, for, for libraries or for policy briefs for governments, or we'll see what way we want to uh, pick up the pieces, but it will be one, one position paper um, that different sections might appeal to different stakeholders, but well, one, one section. Um, we will be using this um, going into the world, going into some of the future, but also to, most importantly uh, to the World OER Congress in Dubai, November nineteenth and twentieth. Right, um, so it's very important for us to, um, you know, to to know our partnership and know our capabilities uh, uh, going into that um, follow up review for governments, but also um, partners working with governments what they could actually achieve uh, uh, you know, in terms of implementing the OER recommendation in 2019. So that's where we are. And thank you for sharing, sharing today, um, Neve, and for taking a lead on the position paper and all the others who've uh, worked so hard to support it. Uh, but we are inviting everyone to put in comments because we will add you as a contributor uh, to the actual position paper as well. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Paul. Don't forget about the diamond engagement. This is the key to the whole thing. And there's a lovely comment from Aaron Tate um, Wimberly, who said that um, they're leaving with more energy, more faith in the power of collaboration and humans looking for the best possible global and local ways to problem solve. That's a really nice comment there in the chat. Thanks so much, everybody, for taking part. We'll be in touch again with the recording and with the, um, the links to where we're going after this. So thanks a million everybody have a great day bye bye